The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Tonight on The Agenda. You could think of that as a kind of disposition, an un a stable underlying disposition to feel anger, where the anger, like, I think, you know, if your heart rate isn't rising or something, it's not really anger, right? Anger has a, a, a pretty recognizable profile. Um, but you could have this underlying resentment. And then what that does is it disposes you to find things to be angry about, to find occasions for anger. Then, later tonight, for so many refugee young people, most refugee young people around the world, even if they are living in a country of exile, they don't have that right to long-term residence and to a pathway to citizenship that would allow them to imagine the future there. Politics has often been referred to as war by other means. To look at the political climate in many places today, that feels especially apt, given the levels of anger and resentment on display. But anger is not the same as resentment. Ultimately, and understanding how they differ might be quite telling about the political forces seeking to sway the public. For their thoughts on this, we're joined in London, UK, by Teresa Capellos, Associate Professor of Political Psychology at the University of Birmingham. In Chicago, Illinois, Agnes Callard, Associate Professor in Philosophy at the University of Chicago. And in our nation's capital, journalist and author David Mosscrop. And we're delighted to have the three of you with us on TVO tonight. I want to just set up our conversation by asking our director, Sheldon Osmond, to put this graphic up because we've got a bit of information we want to share. Gallup runs something called the Global Emotions Index. They do it in 122 countries. And according to its 2022 edition of Negative Experience Index, which consists of self-reported experiences of worry, stress, sadness, physical pain, and anger, it reached a 33 out of 100. 33. That is apparently the highest it has been since the measurement started in 2006 when it was just at 24. And if we focus on anger, 23% of those surveyed felt it. David, to you first. A Washington Post column of last year was entitled, Rage Has Poisoned Public Life in Canada. And you wrote, we should distinguish between righteous and toxic anger. So let's do that. Draw the distinction for us, if you would. I remember getting called into the principal's office in, I think it was seventh or eighth grade and being told, you're angry, kid. Uh, and that's, that's okay. Uh, but what you do with that anger matters a great deal. And so you can distinguish, I mean, to be a little more precise about the, the effects of that anger. Uh, it can become productive. It can be channeled into, uh, for instance, assessing the state of, of not just your own situation, but the sort of structural problems that developed in the first place. Uh, or it can create a kind of backlash against other people. It can build solidarity and movement for change, or it can result in a kind of turning inwards and, as, as I mentioned, a lashing out, which, for instance, might lead to, let's say, you know, occupying the capital city of a country and staying there for weeks. Um, so it, it matters a great deal what, what kind of form that takes. And in the social media age, the digital media age, there's a sort of tendency by elites, political elites, media elites, business elites, to try to harness a lot of that anger for their own ends, which ends up producing lots of, of toxic outcomes. And I was worried a great deal that where we were, um, the, you know, elites were corralling folks in very, very dangerous ways that were going to pay off in very, very dangerous outcomes. Well, let me do a quick follow-up with you since you mentioned the January 6th insurrection. Are you saying left-wing anger good but right-wing anger bad? Well, I would say that as a market socialist, wouldn't I? I mean, I, but there isn't in anything inherently right or, or wrong about left or right-wing anger, but I would say contemporary history not so contemporary history as well, often bears out the case that, you know, there are forms of right-wing anger that are extraordinarily toxic left-wing too, but on balance, uh, they tend to manifest in, in very different ways, although not universally. I would still say the preponderance of right-wing uh, anger has been more toxic and, and destructive than left-wing anger, but that's a whole different episode, maybe. Indeed. Teresa, you've been writing about resentment uh, for quite a time. Somebody 
you quoted calls it a psychological dynamite that threatens democracy. Why do you think? Yeah. So there is a difference between resentment and resent demand, which is an even more toxic, more um, hateful kind of resentment. And it can be a dynamite because what it does is it disengages the individuals that are experiencing this emotional mechanism from their own reality, the reality that is causing the frustrations, the pain, the grievances that they are reacting emotionally to. So although you know, grievances highlight um, the frustrations and the need to address them uh, socially and politically, the emotional responses that come out of that context are not ones that are conducive to pro-social solutions. They lean towards more antisocial preferences, more antisocial um, behaviors, which in the end compromise and stall the progress that they seek to um, invite. So they are counterproductive for their own, but they are dynamite for society in a sense that they have this tendency to undo what is already there. Agnes, let me put some of your words back to you and have you explain what you meant by them. Because you've written, there are two problems with anger. It is morally corrupting and it is completely correct. Okay, explain. Yeah, so... Um... I think the distinction between good and bad anger as it's been drawn um, uh, by David and Teresa has looked, been forward looking. What do you do with the anger? But another question is, where did the anger come from? Um, that is, what are your reasons for being angry? And sometimes we genuinely have reasons for being angry. Um, so like the good anger would presumably be the anger where you had a reason, you were in fact justified, um, a wrong was committed against you. Um, and the problem is that if you have such a reason, you have that reason forever. That is, if the fact that somebody treated you unjustly is a reason to be angry, that never changes because the fact can't change because you can't go back in time. And um, and that means there's a certain kind of rationality to like holding on to grudges. Um, and the the rational structure that that kind of naturally creates in your soul is one where the other person's bad becomes your good. And that's the um, motive of revenge. And so revenge is naturally born out of anger. It's a natural consequence of anger. It's how you see things when you see things from an angry point of view. And that point of view could well be justified. And the justification doesn't expire. That's the scary thing about anger. Well, you, you've prompted a couple of things in my head. Number one, that old Irish expression, what's the point of a good grudge if you can't hold it forever? And the second, <laughs> as I watched Teresa shaking her head, kind of reminds me of something that I discussed with Martha Nussbaum on this program uh, many years ago. And let's play a clip from that, and then we'll pick up the conversation. Shelton, if you would. Anger is a pained response to what the person thinks of as a significant damage to that person's well-being that was wrongfully inflicted. Now, so far, so good. Lots of things meet that description, and it's good to notice wrongful damages when they occur. But then, what is added is that the angry person wishes and hopes that there will be some kind of payback, in other words, doer should suffer. Now that's where I think we stop making sense. But the gut reaction that says somebody's got to pay and I'm going to solve my anguish about this debt by making that doctor pay, that is by itself an irrational reaction and it doesn't do any good. So I think that the anger that people feel comes from the fact that they just don't know how to solve the problem, and they'd rather not face the real problem. They'd rather just hit somebody over the head with a stick and then pretend that that helps to solve the problem. Now, Agnes, that's your fellow Chicagoan saying that uh, vengefulness or an eye for an eye doesn't solve the problem. What do you say to that? I agree it doesn't solve the problem. But the question is, is it a rational response from the point of view of the person who has anger? And I think the answer to that is yes. And the way that you can see it is, um, I was having a discussion last night about with uh, journalist Liz Brunig, and, uh, and one uh, point of the conversation was parenting when your children get into a fight. And so the one child takes something away from the other, and the second child pulls the first child's hair. And the question is, do you treat them differently? 
And her uh, approach is like, of course. I mean, the second child had a reason for pulling her sister's hair. Namely, she'd had a dress snatched away from her. And so, I th and I think we that resonates with many people. That um, look, she did. She wasn't unprovoked, which is to say, the bad thing she did was provoked. The bad thing becomes a good thing because it was a response to another bad thing. In many contexts, we find that very intuitive. But when we really don't like the bad things people are doing, all of a sudden we get really alienated from the point of view of identifying with their anger, and we're like, that's bad. It's unproductive. It's always unproductive. It's unproductive even in the case of the little kid pulling your sister's hair. But it's also very intuitive. Teresa, you were shaking your head earlier. You want to come back on that? It's a very complicated topic, the one we are discussing. It's so interesting, all, all the little angles and the nuances and how we understand emotions. We talk about what is rational. Well, when we are describing anger, we should be thinking about emotional, affective, rather than rational. Uh, rational is more the decision-making of Precision, but here now at the essence of it, we talk about emotion. So we should be talking about affect rather than rationality. But what I think it is also important for us to distinguish is the, the impact of uh, an emotion. Does it have an antisocial outcome or a prosocial outcome? And if you don't want to go as far as the outcome, we can think of intention. Is it an antisocial intention or a prosocial intention? Now, What's going on with revenge? If revenge is part of a desire to spoil, spoiling is not a characteristic of anger, it's a characteristic of envy. So although we could be talking about anger uh, and we could have this public conversation about who is angry, does anger uh, contribute to the solution of society or not, at the end of the day, what people express as anger, what we are used to be identifying as anger, can be concealing other deeper affective states that can be painful, frustration and envy, guilt, shame, inefficacious anger as well. And what we have seen, and with the first poll that you showed us when we started this conversation, is this um, license to be expressing anger in today's society in a way and that's there's benefits to that it's good to be able to recognize emotions and talk about them find the words and express them but it's also really so in a way when you recognize an expression when you ask somebody how does how do you feel they can very quickly tell you i'm angry now does that mean that that's the only thing that they feel probably not does it mean that they have a word to put for the emotion that they are experiencing? Yes, it does. But for us, in political psychology and psychology as well, it is our responsibility to dig a little deeper um, and get to the bottom, the essence of that emotion. Is it just anger? Or are people identifying themselves as angry because there is a public debate about anger, because anger has become very popular as part mm -hmm. of the populist political scene, but effectively what they are feeling and what we see them feeling when we study that anger a little deeper is a little bit more nuanced. In some cases, guilt. In some cases, shame. In some cases, envy. And envy is associated with a desire to spoil. So, Well, let me jump in there for a second and, and put that to David, because this notion of let's make them pay Justified or not, David? Well, the feeling is is certainly justified insofar as it, it's a legitimate response to to stimuli. Uh, we like to think of ourselves in terms of uh, an enlightenment legacy, right? We're rational, dispassionate, calculative machines. Uh, I wrote about this in my my book. Uh, you know, we're, we're told that we are these sort of we have this enlightenment legacy of we uh, of moving through the world and taking raw sensory data and compiling it and evaluating it as one might look at a spreadsheet and then coming to some sort of ideal conclusion and then going forward with that, uh, which is just absolute nonsense, right? It's just not how we really operate in the real world. Uh, we can try to approximate that, and sometimes we can get pretty close. Some people are pretty good at it. Um, but we are fundamentally um, characterized by emotion. Uh, emotion tends to take. We spend a lot of time operating on a sort of fast, intuitive responses to, to the world around us, especially in a complicated world, which is extraordinarily fast and uh, difficult to navigate. And so, in a sense, we've created a world 
developed a world, accidentally fallen uh, bum backwards into a world that um, is almost feels like it's custom built to elicit angry responses and let us challenge them into the, uh, channel them into the world really, really quickly. Think of social media. Uh, so of course that makes a lot of sense. But as has been noted absolutely correctly, it's not super productive, right? In fact, it's, it's deeply counterproductive. And, and anyone who's ever lashed out at someone and then taken a moment to reflect on it might have thought, oh, I wish I hadn't done that. And now the problem's worse. And now what I'm going to do, or now we're into, you know, the Hatfields and McCoys and we know how how um, counterproductive that becomes. Well, all Agnes, that to me makes me... good sense, but it, it doesn't you know, produce anything good. Sure. Agnes, let me circle back to uh, some comments that David made about the January 6th participants, if I can call them that. And I think it's fair to say some of those folks are uh, resentful because they are not completely enamored with the amount of multiculturalism happening in your country or the amount of feminism happening in your country or the you know, notions of fluid sexual orientations and this kind of thing. In your judgment, what should we think about people who have huge problems with all of that? So I think that Teresa was making a really good point about the thought that ang in some cases, anger is sort of epiphenomenal. It's like a flare up of something and there's something more fundamental lying below it. And I think she used the word resentment to characterize that. And you could think of that as a kind of disposition, an un a stable underlying disposition to feel anger, where the anger, like, I think, you know, if your heart rate isn't rising or something, it's not really anger, right? Anger has a... a, a pretty recognizable profile. Um, but you could have this underlying resentment. And then what that does is it disposes you to find things to be angry about, to find occasions for anger. And I also think that she's right that uh, I really like the word license that she used. So I think that um, somehow um, we feel these days like we have a lot of license to find occasions for anger specifically in public spaces. So I think it's probably not an accident that that um, insurrection was in this kind of very public uh, space. Um, but social media is another kind of public space where it's almost like you could think of it as a desecration of the public space. Like it, it it's a free for all. Um, none of us would behave like that with our family, with our loved ones. We wouldn't just like wantonly get angry at them. Even if we are in a bad mood, you can be in a bad mood and you might lash out at your spouse, but you, then you'd be like, I'm sorry. You wouldn't let it overtake you in that way. So I guess um, that that's the general analysis I would give. I don't feel like I have a good, more of a good particular grip on what was motivating that specific set of people. So I don't feel like I'm in a position to diagnose them. Okay, well, David, let me go to you and, and ask whether, I mean, we need to treat people with respect and we need to treat their feelings seriously. Um, <laughs> but are we able to dismiss as irrational uh, some of the views of those who, for example, stormed Capitol Hill in Washington? Well, I mean, it depends on whose rationality we're, we're talking about. I mean, you can behave in what to you seems like a rational way, while an external observer would say that makes no sense to me and seems utterly irrational. Uh, because you're coming from a different place, you you have a different set of facts, quote unquote facts, by the way, and facts are facts, but but to someone who believes them, there is no distinction because they believe them, right? Uh, there might be a broader distinction that's socially determined, but for them, they deeply, deeply believe it, uh, then what they're doing is rational. And and that's part of what, what you know, the, is so thorny about political decision making is that if we're operating in different worlds, in different realities, based on different facts, you know, based on different motivations, who are listening to different media folks, who are telling us different quote unquote truths, um, th then what, what seems reasonable and rational to one set will seem utterly ir irrational and unreasonable to another. And the process of politics is the process of figuring out how we live together despite that, and hopefully in a better situation, trying to come to, to broad agreement about the world so we can minimize a lot of that friction. Um, so I would say looking at them, I thought you know there's a deep politics of resentment on the American right that has long been fostered deliberately by by people uh, for different reasons. It exists in Canada too. Uh, I think that's a kind of deep resentment driven politics that is um, irrational in the sense that the, the grievances aren't reasonable. Uh, but to them, it certainly seems that way that it is. So, you know, what are you going to do about that? That's the ultimate question is what are you going to do about that? And to sort of say, well, you're just a bunch of idiot bumpkins, you're a basket of deplorables. 
that doesn't do it. And I think that's one of the, especially on the left, something we've got to reckon with in, in the contemporary world is that simply dismissing these folks as, you know, angry rubes isn't going to do it. It doesn't work. Hillary's never going to get over saying basket of deplorables, is she? I probably shouldn't. <laughs> gotcha. Uh, okay, Teresa, reactionary feelings. Are they worth less than progressive feelings, particularly when you look at what happened on Capitol Hill that day? We have reactionary feelings, and I've been writing on reactionism for a while, so it's interesting to try to unpick what that is, but we also have radical feelings, and we have retrogressive feelings, and progressive feelings, and conservative feelings. So we think we're dealing with two opposites, but it's more of a well-rounded account of how you could be thinking of political orientations as harboring uh, a particular affective profile. So um, they, there, is a, there is an interesting similarity between um, the affective content of extreme politics, whether they sit on the left or they sit on the right. And what we find is that um, this desire to undo the present and move towards something else is very often motivated by resentment. But that's not necessarily resentment. It's not the sour and toxic grievance that we see played out in politics very often in the more retrogressive parts of the electorate that want to turn things back, but they are not willing to work for it. Reactionaries, um, so perhaps I'm introducing a lot of complexity to this conversation, but reactionaries and radicals do not have a very good relationship with the present. They want to undo the present in a, in a very abrupt um, and often violent way. But what they like to do is either turn things back reactionary orientation or move things forward to an unknown future radical orientation. But you have other spaces in between in these orientations. You could think of the retrogressive citizens who are not comfortable with the present. They are not conservatives. They don't like things to stay as they are. Um, they want to move things back, but their desire for acting, for change, is inhibited by their um, emotional experiences, which is, in essence, resentimental, which is passively angry, um, dormantly endorsing violence, uh, sometimes engaging with it, but not actively going out there seeking it. You could be part of a movement by accident without you being the one organizing it. Now, that is a characteristic of a really particular emotional mechanism that takes your um, envy, your shame, your inefficacious anger, and convert it into resentment. So resentment could be what you see at the output of it, but the process is a really particular, very painful, and involves what we identify as a transvaluation, a change of the value. And this is this is really interesting because when we talk about emotions or when we talk about ideologies, uh, when we talk about anger, you wouldn't expect to be um, witnessing this process of the change of values, of the things that you desire, which you cannot attain, which into something that then you put aside as worthless, as not desirable anymore. So this devaluation of what was initially desired, the unattainable is devalued, and the sense of self from being an individual that doesn't get what that individual wants, uh, an individual that perceives themselves as at the margins of society, perhaps a loser, changes their own perception of their, of their self into a pious and moral victim. And that moral victimhood is mm. the sign, the clear sign that we are not dealing with anger. We are dealing with resentment. Okay, let me it's pick up on that and take that to David, because, David, I want to pick up on something you wrote in one of your columns in the Washington Post, where you wrote, in a democracy, reactionary grievance politics that produces violence should be intolerable. Okay, explain why. Well, because by the time you've reached that, uh, you can no longer um, get together and decide how we ought to live together. It's sort of saying, like, well, we're going to bargain about how we want to run the house, uh, but I'm going to hold a gun to your head. <laughs> 
and then let's have a chat about how we want to, you know, who's going to take out the garbage, right? I mean, like you, you can't bargain under those situations because no longer are you recognizing the other person sitting across from you as a, as a person who has moral equal worth, um, you know, in a, in a democracy in which we self-govern more or less self-govern. That's a different episode. And uh, again, about how, <laughs> how little we actually self-govern, but, uh, but, but let's just say for the purposes here, you know, that, that we have self-government, uh, well then, then we can't do it. Right. And so by the time someone's occupying the capital or occupying Ottawa, uh, you know, in a convoy, uh, you've sort of passed the point of, of, um, of, of democratic politics and you've, you've entered something else. Although I'll put a little bit of a caveat there. There are moral moments in which that is necessary. Think of the civil rights movement in the United States and some of the more radical elements of that. Those, th those were necessary for breaking a wall that wasn't going to be broken with democratic deliberation, right? Which I happen to quite like, but there's some moments where you don't. But this is where we have to sort of click off the liberal uh, intuition that's embedded so deeply in each of us and say, some things are substantially different than others. And we need to distinguish between, say, uh, that kind of manifestation when it's in, in battle of uh, for, for civil rights for, for racialized folks and people who don't want to get a vaccine. Right. And so we have to make those substantive distinctions, which itself is a democratic social process that we have to go through. But by the time people have become violent for for bad reasons, uh, democracy has broken down to the point where uh, it has to be stopped and better institutions have to be reasserted. In which case, Agnes, let me get your take on the, I don't know, roughly 20 or 30 percent of the population in both your country and mine that have developed reactionary, anti-modern feelings. They are angry at the world. Um, a world which doesn't seem to care very much about what they think about various things. What's your take on that? Okay, so I guess as a philosopher, I distinguish practical questions from theoretical questions. And But maybe one of the really distinctive features of public life is people are always trying to make decisions they can't make in a public way. Like, here's what we should do, even though that isn't going to be done by your saying it. And so it often confuses me. Um, so, like, but I think there is stuff we can do individually um, that is... You can individually talk to the people you can talk to. And there's a question, how do you interact with someone um, if they're like uh, expressing resentful sentiments? Um, how do you talk to such a person? How do you talk to such people on Twitter? How, right. So those are those are actual situations we can encounter. Um, there, there isn't some I don't think there's some immediate lever we can press at a governmental level where we like uh, do something to those people, right? That's just not a, that's not an option that's on the table. So there's no, from my point of view, there's no point in deliberating what we should do when we can't do anything. But I guess I think that um, uh, the, the best I've been able to find is to interact with people inquisitively um, and uh, to see whether there is anything that you have to learn from them. Hmm. And, uh, people are pretty receptive to other people having that approach. And um, they're pretty resistant to people who have the approach of, without at all thinking that I might have something to learn from you, let me teach you a bunch of things about how you're on. That feels like very good advice. Uh, less than five minutes to go here. Let's see if we can get a couple of more things on the table. Therese, I'll come to you on the issue of resentment because you have studied that in Greece. You live currently in the United Kingdom. Do individual cultures express resentments differently? Yes, there are. There's always emotions are always culturally embedded, right? So they are experienced, they are expressed, they are recognized, and they're acted out or they are uh, performed um, differently in different cultures. But our role as political psychologists, social scientists, is to trying to understand the commonalities across cultures. Um, of course, understand the nuance in different places. Um, cultures are not just the only thing of the story. It's also the social, political environment, the context, which is not just about culture, is the what's going on at a particular place at a given point in time. And at the time we were studying Resentiment in Greece, that was during the financial crisis. And so it was a really pressurized crisis environment. And we were really interested in understanding how people respond to this. And we've also looked at uh, similar pressurized environments in the United Kingdom, 
around the Brexit time, where there were different kinds of grievances. But what we found, which was similar, and in the US, where we looked at data there, but what we found across these different political and um, cultural systems, they call them like that, is that there was a, a common response to politics, which was to deal with politics through grievance. So expressing grievances, identifying grievances, looking at politics as the place of grievance was the similarity that we saw um, across these three contexts. And that got us thinking that perhaps a very new phenomenon that we are encountering is that of grievance politics, um, which is approaching political debate, political disagreement, um, political frustrations from a grievance perspective which immediately puts the other as your opponent, immediately, not an opponent that you want to debate in a deliberative democracy fashion, but as somebody that you want to eliminate, to dominate. So there is a real, a, a really interesting particular way of engaging with the social um, uh, relationships that constitute democratic politics. And what David was saying before is linked to this, that once you start dealing with anybody else as somebody that is out to get you, somebody who has pushed you out, or somebody who has taken away what is rightfully yours, and um, you could do this either in real locales or online, then you start engaging with people in a really particular emotional tone. And that is not a tone that can provide pro-social outcomes. Right. Let me save a minute here. Tone. We're down to our last minute. Let me save it for David, because uh, you're here in Canada, but you write about Canada for an American publication. So I wonder if you, have you come to any conclusions about where, whether we're becoming more like them? I think Canada is becoming slightly more polarized. There's some data on this. Edelman has a trust barometer, and they look at polarization. The data was fairly interesting is that Canada is shifting to a more uh, toxic polarized. There's nothing inherently wrong with being polarized. Toxic polarization is different. Uh, we're becoming less trusting as well. And I, I and I, I rushed to add this because we didn't have a chance to talk about it, but there's also a class dimension to this that is utterly central to understanding a lot of this, and that there's a huge class mm -hmm. divide. And that when you break down a lot of the data and the numbers, you do see a class divide on things, for instance, like like trust, um, and, and that's significant as well. And I do think you know we have been insulated uh, against some of it in part because of our our national institutions, uh, some cultural bits, and some you know social programming, which helps a lot. But I do worry that that's eroding and that we're moving towards a more toxic, polarized environment. You know, the old cliche is that we're sort of ten years behind America. It's not a bad heuristic, and and probably we're, there's something to it in this case. Gotcha. David Moskrop, Agnes Callard, Teresa Capellos, we thank all three of you for coming on to TVO tonight and having this most interesting conversation. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. There are more than 26 million people in the world today who are living as refugees, and half of them are children. Oftentimes, they live in exile without a permanent home for a decade, sometimes two decades. What happens to those kids? Do they go to school? How do they learn? Can they ever be expected to lead so-called normal lives? These are questions which preoccupy Sarah Dryden-Peterson. She is a professor at the Harvard Graduate School of Education and the founder and director of Refugee Reach, which promotes research, education, and action for refugees and she explains in her book, Right Where We Belong, How Refugee Teachers and Students Are Changing the Future of Education, How It's All Gonna Work. Sarah, it's great to welcome you here to TVO. Thank you, nice glad to, have you to here. be here. I wanna start by reading an excerpt from your book, Right Where We Belong. Sheldon, if you would, bring this up and I'll read along for those listening on podcast. Millions of refugee children globally risk spending their entire childhoods as if in suspended animation, as if their futures are on hold. They are less likely to go to school. They are less likely to finish school. They are less likely to learn. And they are less likely to feel like they can contribute to their communities. What would it take to ensure that all refugee young people have access to learning that enables them to feel a sense of belonging, 
and prepares them to help build more peaceful and equitable futures. I have spent the last 15 years focused on this question. Okay, my first question is about you. Mm. Why has this question fascinated and vexed you so much? That is a good question. <laughs> um, you know, I, I was thinking about this, and I think, I mean, like many of us, aspects of our autobiography really shape the kinds of questions that we ask. Um, and I think there were two real elements of growing up here in Toronto that really shaped me in wanting and continuing to ask this question. One was that when I was growing up, we had a huge map of the world on the wall of our kitchen. Um, and it was really of our kitchen and our family life, as we would learn about something that was going on in the world, we would find it on the map. And my parents would talk to my brother and I about various places and ask us questions to try to prompt us to see ourselves in relation to the rest of the world. And the second piece, I think, growing up in Toronto in the 80s and 90s was really about trying to understand migration, that so much of Toronto was being shaped by migration at that time. And I became, as a young person and a teenager, really preoccupied with this question of what it would mean for a new community to be created in a place um, where people were coming from all over the world, from so many places that we saw on the map in our kitchen, to build a new community in one place that was is our home, Toronto. So it's a very personal story for you in some respects. It is, yeah. Cool. There has been an international convention for seven decades that defines what a refugee is. And let's bring this up as well if we can. This is also from your book. Those who are outside their countries of nationality, owing to well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group, or political opinion. If you are a young refugee living with this kind of fear, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes for very long periods of time, are you actually able to be educated? Mm. Right. And this is actually, I think, the real question also at the core of this book is to try to think about what it means for someone who has been forced to flee their home due to persecution. Um, and I come back to this idea. There's a, a poet, Washan Shire, who writes that um, one only leaves home when home won't let you stay. And I really hold that as core in thinking about education of refugee young people. Um, for the most part, people who have not wanted to leave their home and who are trying to build a life in a new place. Um, and often trying to build a life in the context where they still don't have a lot of their rights respected. And sometimes that includes not the right to education, but frequently does not include the right to access opportunities that we think will follow from education. So you and I went to school likely thinking that when we graduated from school, we would be able to find a job and legally be able to work in that job, that we would be able to decide where in the country of our citizenship we wanted to live and build a life and imagine that kind of future. For so many refugee young people, most refugee young people around the world, even if they are living in a country of exile, they don't have that right to long-term residence and to a pathway to citizenship that would allow them to imagine the future there. So this becomes a core question for education, how to educate for a future that really is unknowable in so many ways. Now, obviously they can be educated and obviously they, like all young people, they have a desire to be sponges and take it all in. But if you're, if you're actually worried about where your next meal is coming from, or whether you got a roof over your head, or whether troops are going to come over that hill and kill your parents, those are not ideal conditions under which to try to learn something new. Right. So how does that happen? Right. And so um, in many cases, like you're saying, this first element is to really try to think about how can schools become safe places where right. children feel like they are ready to learn because they feel like they can know what comes next. They feel like they are in a safe place. And I think importantly, this is true not only for students, but also for teachers. So the adults in the building, for example, with students are also fearing the same kinds of security um, threats um, to their daily existence. Um, and so that safety becomes key. I think what one of the things that we've learned from refugee young people is that that thinking about the immediate moment, kind of where the next meal is coming from, that security is essential, but it's not really sufficient to work towards what they're hoping for. And this sense of always thinking about the future, even when the immediate situation um, feels like an emergency. And I think that's something that has really struck me um, 
and as somewhat surprising, I think, in learning from refugee young people. Like, yes, we want to focus on this immediate moment. Yes, we're concerned about it. But don't think for a moment that we're not also concerned about what comes next. And I think this really shapes the way that young people try to navigate their education as they're thinking about um, not only kind of the next day, but also how do they fulfill the steps that they need in order to graduate from secondary school, for example, or in order to access transnationally if something is not available locally, the kinds of learning that they're looking for. Yeah. One thing that's abundantly clear as you read the book is that you have been all over the bloody world. I mean, you've really been to a lot of places and you've met a lot of people, and we're going to talk about a few of them here, okay? Jacques lives as a refugee in Uganda. Let's start there. Why is he in Uganda? Mm -hmm. Um, so Jacques fled to Uganda from the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, and this was some 20 years ago mm -hmm. now. As I, um, as you mentioned earlier, I've been doing this work for a long time yeah. and really been able to learn from Jacques over um, almost all of those years. Why so, did he have to leave the DRC? So he had to leave the DRC because there was ongoing conflict in Eastern DRC. Um, one of the largest civil wars of our time that often goes underreported in, um, in our media. Um, and he was a human rights activist. And so he was persecuted, to come back to this definition of a refugee, for the work that he was doing on behalf of his ethnic and linguistic group. So he had to flee to Uganda, where he hoped to find the safety and security that was no longer possible in the home. And interestingly he enough, he doesn't live, or I guess like 60% of refugees, as I learned in your book, he doesn't live in a camp, mm -hmm. he lives in a city. City. Is that a better way for refugees to live? Yeah, I mean, I think better depends on the situation. Um, and as we see with Jacques, um, at the time that he lived in Uganda, refugees were not um, legally allowed to live in the city. But he was a teacher. Um, and when he tried to go to a refugee camp, it wasn't possible for him to build a sustainable life there. And so he decided that as he'd been taught as a young teacher in Democratic Republic of Congo, that when you arrive in the middle of a forest, of which there are many in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, and there are children who are eager to learn, you figure out a way mm -hmm. to teach them. And I think this idea of a teacher really having this vocation to teach children where wherever they are, um, stuck with Jacques. And so he created a school in Kampala, in the city, for the many refugees who were living there, even though that was counter um, to policy it's at in that a church. time. It was in a it's church. It's in a church That's with right. a dirt floor. Yes. Not yeah. what you call ideal circumstances. No. But what could he do under those mm -hmm. circumstances to educate this group of refugee kids? I think, I think he... The part of his circumstances that were ideal, with, I think, are the elements, actually, that all of us might remember being the most ideal about our schools, which is the teachers and the students and the relationships among them. So despite the, the challenging resource environment, um, Jacques and his fellow teacher really created a situation in which the children wanted to be there to come back to this idea of the security that students were seeking, even in a place where they didn't have legal right to be, and created the kind of relationships that really allowed allowed those children to feel that sense of wonder at what they mm. were learning. And so that's what he was able to create out of very limited mm. resources. Where's he today? He's in Ottawa. He lives in Ottawa mm -hmm. today. Yeah. Is he becoming a Canadian citizen? Yes. He is. Yes. How about yeah. that? Let's talk about Abdi, mm -hmm. born in Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. When he was a teenager, he watched his parents die. Mm -hmm. Again, how can you how can you even begin to care about getting an education when you've watched your parents be killed? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I think it, like in Abdi's situation and in many of the young people we've worked with in Dadaab refugee camp in northern Kenya um, who had, had fled Ethiopia, fled Somalia, um, many of them really talk about this idea of contributing to some kind of a future, of ideally, in their um, words, their home country. And so thinking about not just all of the horrible things that have happened to them, which they're not trying to ignore, but to figure out how to live with, and thinking about how to, to move forward with that and think about the role that they can play in building a future um, in their conflict-affected countries. And education is almost always what we hear young people talk about as the key to that. It's not something that has to be rooted in one particular place, but instead something that can really travel with a person and be that capital that they take um, to build the future um, for themselves and also for communities. And where is Abdi now? Um, also in Canada. No kidding, yeah. also yeah. here. Yeah. If you're a refugee, where's the best country in the world to live? Hmm. 
You know, I, I think I think this is one of the tricky questions that we face as a global community. Um, I think that what we see is that there's a vastly unequal distribution of where refugees live globally. Um, so more than 73% of refugees live in a neighboring host country. So that means when, when civil war happens in Syria, that Syrians are fleeing to Lebanon and Turkey. When conflict happens in Democratic Republic of Congo, like for Jacques, refugees are fleeing to Uganda and Kenya. Um, and very few refugees um, come to Canada, come to the United States. In 2017, one quarter of the population in Lebanon was a refugee, and at that same time, it was 0.01% of the U.S. population. Hmm. So we think about this vast difference in where refugees are. You can imagine the kind of resources that can be dedicated to supporting refugees to build a new life when there are very few and when they're arriving over long periods of time than when there might be hundreds of thousands of people. So you can think about kind of a, a, a refugee arriving in Canada, coming into a school where there may be very few refugees and teachers can really focus on the learning needs, addressing any kind of gaps, making sure that parents feel welcome in the school and that that becomes much more challenging in a place where maybe overnight half the class becomes well, a refugee. let me pick up on that, because yeah. uh, you mentioned Lebanon, which found itself, I guess, a few years ago, taking in 1.5 million mm -hmm. Syrian refugees. How does a country like Lebanon, which is not a rich country, obviously, to begin with, even begin to understand how it will be obliged to educate? Mm -hmm. uh, I, get, I mean, 1.5 million Syrian refugees, do I assume half of them are kids? Yeah, right. So how do they find spaces for 750,000 kids mm -hmm. Like that. like that. Right. And so this is the immense challenge that countries that are receiving many, many, many refugees are up against. What happened in Lebanon was the development of, um, over the course of the first, the initial years of Syrians arriving, was the development of a double shift. So this means Lebanese students go to school in the morning, and then in the same buildings, Syrian students come to school in the afternoon. This is actually a pretty common setup for education globally, when there are many kids and not the kind of infrastructure. And I think what this enabled enabled was access to schools for Syrian refugees. So there was actually the possibility of Syrian young people coming to school. Um, but the challenge, as this double system kind of points to, is that there's very little opportunity for Lebanese kids and Syrian kids to actually interact with each other, to build the kinds of relationships that as we talked about with Jacques, were really core to the kind of learning um, that was going on. Um, and so, and this becomes a challenge over time. Like you said, Lebanon, a country that doesn't, already has overstretched resources in terms of its education system. I think one of the things that we see in the case of Lebanon too, is that over many years, other donors, other international um, commitments were made to support the education of refugees in Lebanon, and many of those have gone unfunded. And so this leaves Lebanon needing to support the education of refugee children, even though there are global compacts that would suggest all of us have an obligation to contribute to that education. But I assume those, let's say, three quarters of a million Syrian refugee kids now in Lebanon, mm -hmm. that's three quarters of a million young people mm -hmm who, if we sort of don't get this right and get them some kind of decent education, they're going to be bad news for the whole world come mm. 15, 20 years down the road. Fair to say? I mean, yeah, listening to refugee, to Syrian young people, we were working with grade nine, the equivalent of grade nine students. Um, and one student said to us, um, kind of look at the quality of education we're getting. It's really not what I had hoped for. It's mm. not a high quality education. But she said, there's no country that treats its own citizens, um, the c citizens of other countries better than its own citizens. So mm. I understand this situation. And I think that's what we stand to lose as a global community if young people start to think that there is this um, hierarchy of who deserves more. Um, and we think about young people who are living outside of their country of origin, thinking that they deserve less in terms of their mm. education. And that translates into less opportunity then for them to contribute to um, future lives in Syria, future lives in Lebanon, or wherever their journeys might take them. Right. I, this line that you say to your students at Harvard uh, really grabbed me. Mm -hmm. it's, how will this program, the one you are teaching, how will this program affect the lives of real people? Mm -hmm. You're obviously trying to get your students not to just see this as some academic exercise, mm -hmm. but this is, this is serious on the ground. You've got to change people's lives somewhere in the world. Mm 
What answers do you come up with when you ask that question? Um, so this, this is a project that students engage in where they interview one person to try to understand their trajectory through education and conflict. Um, and often there's pushback in saying, well, this is just one person. How can I learn about what policies I should implement or what programs I should design? But what I think it does is force us all to ask that question in moments where we're sitting with a policy that says, for example, the language of instruction in um, in a host country for a refugee will be the language of that that host country. To think not only about what is practical, obviously that's much more practical than trying to educate in 20 different languages, but also what that might mean for the trajectory of a young person. To think about um, another um, person I write about in the book, Henri, who was educated in multiple languages in his um, time in Tanzania, where the language of instruction changed, and then he returned to Burundi, although he'd actually never lived in Burundi. He was born in Tanzania and wasn't fluent enough in the languages that that were required by the university to be able to continue going to school. And so to have these trajectories of individual people in our heads when we're thinking about policies, I think really changes the nature of what we end up deciding, not only is cost efficient at the time or pragmatic, but also stands a chance of actually creating more opportunities for refugee young people. I, you tell me if I'm going out on a limb here, but mm. I would think that we ought to be good at this, given that mm. the first refugees that we dealt with <clears throat> was 200 years ago, mm. more than 200 years ago, when the United Empire Loyalists mm. left the United States, came up to Canada. We've been at this for a while. Mm -hmm. Are we any good at this? I think that every generation has to learn to be good at creating community with mm. other people um, in many ways. I think one, um, one idea that I keep coming back to, this is an anthropologist, Mary Catherine Bateson, talks about how most educators, this is in the US, live within 100 miles of where they were born. But they might as well be immigrants themselves because the world has changed on them. And I think we forget this, that even those of us who may stay where it is that we're born, um, the world changes around us and we need to learn how to navigate these new situations. Some of the new work that we're doing is really trying to think not only about refugees, but also about longtime residents and how does solidarity among refugees and longtime residents both develop initially, but also how do we sustain it over time? And this is what I think we've been less good at in many ways, is thinking about how do we, how do we consider both the needs of those who have never moved as well as those who have moved and bring people together to create new types of learning in schools, for example. Well, let's c conclude then around the mm -hmm. original question that we asked at the beginning of our conversation, which was, what would it take to ensure that all refugee young people have access to learning that enables them to feel a sense of belonging? Yeah. Okay, what would it take? I think um, one of the things I do in the book is try to really think about these concentric circles of our spheres of action. Um, and I think that one of the biggest questions and challenges is to think about the root causes that are driving people to need to flee their homes in the first place. So what is it about home that won't let people stay? And how do we think about the kinds of politics and economics that would support more people to stay in the places they love that are home? Um, related to that, I think are migration policies that really end up keeping people out. And the way this relates to education is that so for a Syrian refugee in Lebanon, for example, doesn't know how long they will be able to stay in Lebanon because that residence is contingent on um, the, the government there saying, okay, we'll extend this um, ability for Syrians to stay here which for a given someday they of time, might not. Which someday they might not. And as a student, you're thinking about, well, someday they might not. Will I be able to finish primary school? Will I be able to finish secondary school? What will happen if that someday comes and this refuge has expired? And so as we think about migration policies that that for the most part are intended to keep people out, how do we think about the ways in which those policies really influence young people as they're going through school? Um, I think the third element is, is really about how we as a global community think about the places where most refugees are being educated. And so those of us sitting in Toronto, what responsibility do we have to the Syrians who are being educated in Lebanon, or to the Rohingya who are being educated in Bangladesh, or to the Venezuelans who are being educated in Colombia. That is not, should not be the sole responsibility of those countries that have opened their borders in order for people to live there. Mm -hmm. And then I think the fourth level is really within the classroom. And this is what we see, I think, most in this book, is that 
teachers and young people are trying to create this sense of belonging by really opening up, for example, the kinds of histories that they teach so kids can see themselves represented in that history, trying to open up this opportunity to talk about not only the way things are today that can feel very discriminatory, mm -hmm. but also the way young people hope they will be in the future, um, and those very micro-level interactions that are hard to build policy around, hard to legislate, are really the core of what, what it would take to develop hmm. this kind of education. Great. I have one last question, and I won't pretend it's the most important question I'm going to ask you today. Who is your favorite goaltender in the history of the National Hockey League? <laughs> My dad. <laughs> Sheldon, there we go. You recognize that guy? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> You're Ken Dryden's daughter. Mm -hmm. Wanted to get that on the record there. Because he's been in that chair a few times. I know, you know. he has. Yeah. yeah, it's been yeah. fun to watch him. We enjoy his visits here yeah. as well. Great. He's almost as good as you as a guest. <laughs> That's Sarah Dryden Peterson, right where we belong, how refugee teachers and students are changing the future of education. Sarah, it's great to meet you, and thanks for coming in tonight. Thanks so much, Steve. Great to see you. Tomorrow on the agenda. The world benefits from our ability to understand the biology and the environmental contributions in terms of helping for health span and longevity span. But the other uh, important societal contribution of these uh, elite agers, super agers, is that they help us understand our history. Also, tomorrow on the agenda. This is something that we'd hear often, is that the individuals, again, often coming from marginalized neighborhoods who were arrested and ultimately convicted, and some of whom were imprisoned uh, for um, possessing or even trafficking in quantities of cannabis that would be you know, just snickered at by um, people operating in the legal cannabis industry now. To have them still behind bars while this legal op uh, industry was operating in the jurisdiction in which they were incarcerated, you know, myself and, and, and the individuals affected found you know, just so highly offensive. That's tomorrow on The Agenda. The Agenda with Steve Pagan is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.